Dr. Dennis Burke. Let's give him a big living word welcome. Thank you, sir. Bless you. Thank you. Bless you, too. Glory to God. Thank you for that welcome. Come on, shout a praise to the Lord Jesus. He is King and Lord of all. Thank you, Jesus. It is so great to be back at Living Word. Stay standing with me just for a moment, if you would. You know, I'm delighted to be able to come back. I've come back each year for many, many years. I really value this ministry. It's just one of the premier churches in America from all of my understanding, and I'm just delighted to be able to be a part. Your pastors, Pastor Mac and Lynn, are just a tremendous team that God's raised up, and, and, uh, and you're a part. You're a big part of the whole vision here. And so to be able to minister to you today, I have an expectation. I'm expecting the Holy Spirit to do just what He does around here. He brings help and hope and healing and restoration to anybody that will take it. Anybody that needs something from God, you're in the right place at the right time. The Spirit of the Lord is in this place. And the Bible's clear that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. If you need liberty in any realm of your life, in your finances, in your body, if you need liberty in your head, your soul, you're in the place where the presence of the Lord is here to do exactly that in your life. So flip the switch of expectation in your own mind and just lay hold on it and let the anointing of God do what He does best. Amen. Amen. Come on, would you shout a praise to the Lord one more time here? Come on. Praise the Lord. Glory to Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. You know, we do know that the Spirit of the Lord is everywhere. We get that. He's, he's com completely encompasses the earth. He always has. You can't go any place where the Spirit of the Lord is not. And yet we use this terminology that we are in the presence of the Lord. Not so much to say that God is here in a different way. He is always ready and willing and interested. But when we dial in, as we have today, when you dial yourself in to the presence of God being available and being here, something shifts on the inside. We give access to God into our life in a big way and in a better way than when we're distracted and we're involved in other things. I mean, we understand this. God seems to do more in people in an environment like this than in other places. I mean, uh, more people get saved, get healed, get help here than they would like at the bar. <laughs> and I know that's not a deep subject or concept, but uh, why is that? I mean, he, his presence is there, but something shifts when you honor God. When you put yourself in a position and in a mindset to honor him, Man, he, is, he draws close, and he's ready to impart himself. He doesn't come just to take at all. He's not a taker. He's a giver. God so loved that he gave, and he continues to give, and he's come to give something to you right now. Whatever point of need you have, he's come to do something good in your life today. Yeah. Said out loud, God has come to do something good in me, in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, late, late last year, I start to tune in to some things that the Spirit of God would be emphasizing for me personally and in, in ministry and in things uh, that God wants emphasized and I uh, just had God drop some concepts inside me. You know how you do at the end of the year or at the beginning of the year, you get some things in mind that uh, uh, you hope and believe are right from the Spirit of God. And he dropped some things in me. I want to start with you today, entering into this year of 2023. He dropped in me that, number one, this would be a time for advancement of a fearless entry into this year. Fearlessness. We understand that fear is the currency of the kingdom of darkness, like faith is the currency of the kingdom of God. 
And God says over and over and over again in Scripture, over 300 times, He says, do not be afraid. In different settings and in different issues and times, He told the leaders or people that He was working through at that instant, He said, fear not or do not fear. Set aside the fears. Judge them. Drive them out. He had all kinds of instructions. And so I want you to take hold of that idea, first of all. Listen to this statement. He's you're familiar with it. 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power. Say power. power. That's that dunamis power, explosive power. It really could be translated and used uh, to describe hurricane force or unstoppable movement and power that just cannot be altered. He has given us the spirit of power and of love, that God kind of love, the agape uh, love of God that is just overwhelming in its greatness and goodness and unchanging in its scope. He's given us the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Satan is doing his best to attack people's mind and soul and we have God on our side to make it clear and we're going to talk about this a bit further today but to make it clear that when you allow the spirit of God to flood through your head and your soul, your mind and will and emotions, you harmonize and align your spirit and soul and put yourself in a place of really powerful victories. So the first concept he dropped in me is that this is a time to launch into a fearlessness on a higher level than ever before in Jesus' name. Said out loud, I'm choosing fearlessness. The second concept he dropped in me was that this would be our season to lift up that idea of being filled with faith. We have faith, and we have faith in God, but here's what he says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, without faith, it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, we do believe that he is, but it's more than that, and that he is a rewarder of those who who what? Who diligently seek Him. That's what we're here and what it's all about here for us today. But it's not just on a weekend basis, man. It is a lifestyle of seeking. And He said this, for those that are seekers, He's ready and wants to bring reward into your life. He wants to lift you into higher places in the faith-filled life is designed to create greater reward experiences and your involvement with God. That is God's design. He's not just wanting to exist in your life. He doesn't just exist. He is a rewarder, and you got to keep that in mind, man. He wants to bless you. And he's got a variety of things he wants to reward your life with. And this year is destined and designed to be times of exploring just how far God would want to take that for you. So declare it out loud, I'm filled with faith. And I'm filling up in a higher way. The third thing he said, not only that we would be fearless and this be a time for being faith-filled, but that we would also be surrounded by favor. Psalm 512 reads this way, says, For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous, that's us, and with favor you will surround him as with a shield. The goodness and favor and love of God, he wants to demonstrate it and let it be a shield of divine protection around you, spirit, soul, and body. The favor and goodness and love of God in manifestation, not just that it exists, but that there's real experiences where things are actually happening of the favor of God on a higher level. Say it out loud. Favor, favor. is on a high level, and it's on the rise in my life. Glory to God. That's good, isn't it? Fearless, faith-filled, surrounded by favor. Say it out loud. Fearless, faith-filled, surrounded by favor. Hallelujah. 
That's got to be a great way to live, and that's where we're at right now in Jesus' name. You know, God's got so many things in these days. If we understand this, we understand that we are in the last days. Do you, do you get that? We're in the last days. Although technically, really, when you look at Scripture, the last days began on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts chapter 2. That's what Peter stood up and said uh, when he said, this is that that the prophet Joel prophesied about, that in the last days there would be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And that happened then and has continued all of these decades since. And yet here's what we know and what we recognize is happening. The signs of the times are crystal clear that we are in the last of the last days. There's so many things taking place that Scripture described would happen in the last days and as the age is being wrapped up. Now look, we don't know. I don't know for sure, and I'll just say it this way. There's no date in mind. I've been hearing that Jesus was coming soon since I gave my life to the Lord in 1971. I was excited about it then. I am as excited about it now and more so. Jesus is coming soon. The sooner the better. Like right now is fine. But all through the years, you just go through this thinking and realize that not only is he coming soon, but he hasn't come yet. So are we truly the final generation? Well, you know, we would like to think so, and I tend to think so, and I think we've got good reason to think so, but what we know for sure is that this is our final generation. <laughs> we know that without question. But here's what Jesus told his disciples that really relates to this exact position that we're in now. It was right at the end of his natural ministry, just before, I mean, it was just moments probably before he was going to be arrested and uh, taken into those, those crazy courts and then ultimately murdered, and thank you, Jesus raised from the dead. But he had this statement for his disciples at the end of John's Gospel, chapter 16, and verse 33. The Passion Translation reads this way, For in this unbelieving world you will experience trouble and sorrows, but you must be courageous, for I have conquered the world. In this world you will have trouble and sorrows. How many have uh, verified that that has certainly been a true statement for you. In this world, we all go through issues, trouble, problems, attacks, strategies of the devil, things we know we are redeemed from, and yet Satan just hammered us with something. And here's how Jesus said our mindset has to be maintained. He said, in the world you'll have it happen, but you must be courageous. Say courageous. You must be courageous, fearless in the face of trouble. That doesn't mean that fear doesn't strike at you and hit you. It means you have discovered what it takes to override and overcome the fears that, that threaten you. He said you must be courageous. One, trans, or one dictionary actually of this word uh, courage or courageous, to be courageous is to... Uh, be buoyant in spirit. I like that dictionary uh, of, of what it means to be courageous. It is to me buoyant in spirit. You know what it means to be buoyant. It means you get pulled under the water, you kick it loose, whatever drags you under, and you float right back to the top because there is something inside you that is buoyant. It is the anointing and the presence of God in you that you are not in fear over the issues Satan's brought against you, but you have found a reason to be fearless even in the face of these troubling and serious issues. Courageous, floating, buoyancy, right back up to the top in Jesus' name. 
So he said, be courageous. I have conquered the world. Now look, he's the ultimate demonstration of how powerful that is because at that very moment that he said those words that we just read, all of the forces of darkness, Satan's kingdom, had been descending on him. It had been happening for his entire life. But now all of hell has zeroed in on Jesus and the pressure was immense. I mean, they've already gathered a mob of people. Judas has already, has already sold him out and betrayed the Lord. They're gathering. They're on their way to arrest Jesus. As Jesus is describing this, Satan is convinced that he has had his way and he's about to conquer Jesus. You know, Satan was told something in Genesis 3.15 that really sparked all of this trouble uh, and, and gave Satan this mindset against Jesus. God told Satan, that serpent, in Genesis 3.15, that one will come who will crush your head. And from that point forward, Satan was waiting and looking for anyone that God would use so he would apply the pressure. When the prophets rose up, here came attacks against every single one of them. They all faced all kinds of problems and trouble. But the moment Jesus came up out of the waters of baptism from John, the Father spoke right out of heaven and said, You are my beloved Son, the one in whom I'm well pleased. And at that instant, there was now no question the kingdom of darkness knew exactly who that one was from Genesis 3.15, and it was Jesus. All of hell descended against Jesus from that day forward. And at this instant, when Jesus uttered these words we've read, Satan thought he had Jesus exactly where he wanted him. He was about to destroy him. It was all in motion. What Satan didn't realize is that he was in a trap. that God was about to destroy the strength of the kingdom of darkness through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Glory to God. Now, because of that, you know the truth of this. You have the right to be courageous with his courage because he conquered. Now you get to conquer just because you've connected to him. In Jesus' name, you've got the right to conquer, and the authority to conquer. But conquering, we've all proven it, it doesn't happen accidentally. It doesn't happen automatically. It happens because we follow the Word and we lay hold on what the Spirit of God has said and given to us so that we're living in a place and in a mindset where we are fearless, we are faith-filled, and understand we are surrounded by the favor of God. Say it out loud, I'm surrounded. <laughs> you know, it looks sometimes like you're surrounded by an enemy, but what we understand is that God surrounds whatever has surrounded you. And he just goes ahead and surrounds the enemy. Glory to God. There's all kinds of great stories in Scripture that we have of that exact thing happening. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But we learned some things. This is why we continue to study and get into the Word and why you're locked into a church like this that teaches and presents the Word with such excellence as you get around here. But I want to point out one particular passage and one stretch of Scripture from Psalm 77 where the writer of this psalm, Asaph, who was a powerful man of God himself, a man that King David had appointed to be the chief worshiper and leader of, of things in worship during that era of time. And he wrote several psalms, and he wrote Psalm 77. And in this psalm, here's what we're going to discover. We're going to discover the window into Asaph's own thinking and the challenges he faced and the mindset that he had, the wrong thinking that he was allowing, and then how he shifted this. Thank God for people that can be transparent and free and confident enough to let us see into a mindset and thinking that is not serving you well, and then give you the, the tools, the ingredients, the shift 
that happened in them and tell you exactly how it can happen in you the same so that you can have the kind of victories over the pressures that have come at you. So we're going to read a few things out of Psalm 77. I'll begin right at the start. In verse 1, it says, I cried out to God with my voice, to God with my voice, and he gave ear to me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. So this man's facing trouble, just like we all have. Maybe are now. Some of you are right in the midst of maybe the biggest crisis you've ever been in in your life. And you're in a place where there is help and hope and healing for you right now. But he said, in the day of trouble, I sought the Lord. My hand was stretched out in the night without ceasing. But now watch this. He said, my soul refused to be comforted. That's such a strange thing to say. And yet I can identify with that exactly. I've, I'm reaching out to God, but I'm not, really, I'm not really experiencing the kind of input right now, the relief that I really want and need. And it's, it's not really working right this minute. So he said this, he goes on in verse 3, he said, I remembered God and I was troubled. Somehow that, those two thoughts shouldn't fit together like they are right here in this one verse. I remembered God, but it was trouble in my mind. What would be troubling about remembering God? Well, he doesn't give us more detail about that exact thought, but it could be I remembered what God did for some, but what he hasn't done for me. Whatever I've heard has not happened for me. I'm reaching out, and it doesn't feel like things are getting any better at all. Have you ever been in this kind of situation yourself? Okay, maybe I'm alone in this. I could identify with this. You reach out, you know things, you understand something about God. You've heard Pastor Mac teach some dynamite messages, and yet, it, what's happening here? I'm reaching out, but it troubles me. Even though I'm in the midst of thinking as I reach out to God, I'm being overwhelmed. And he goes on and he said, I not only was troubled, but I complained. And my spirit was overwhelmed. So now we've been given a very clear prescription on how to get overwhelmed and how to stay there. And that's where some people have been dwelling for a long time. Overwhelmed by the circumstances, by events, by the pressures, by what's not changing or what has changed that we didn't want to see change in that direction. What does he say here again? He says, I was reaching out to God. I refused to be comforted. I was troubled. I complained. And I'm overwhelmed. You know, complaining will really help the cause of overwhelmed. <laughs> you know, some Christians are just, just serious complainers. I, I don't mean to sound judgmental and harsh. I'm not thinking of anybody here. There was a few in the earlier service I'm thinking about. <laughs> no, really. no it's from last night. No, but you listen to some people, man. They're high-level complainers. They complain about... Just about everything that the unbelievers are complaining about. How bad it is, how much worse it looks, how high the prices are, how low the income is, or whatever it is that's going on for them. The pressure they're under, they're complaining about it, and they voice it on a regular basis. And the real truth is that nobody wants to listen to you complain. Thank you for your enthusiasm over the depth of that revelation, but... <laughs> But it leads you into or at least keeps you in a place of being overwhelmed and not really seeing the kind of victories that you were designed for. And then Asaph takes it even a bit further. We drop down to verse 7 and he starts to ask some questions here. These are all questions he's asking of God. And these are questions, these six questions kind of summarize just about all different kinds of unbelief. So watch this. He said, will the Lord cast off forever? Will he be favorable no more? Notice it's all about the Lord here. Has his mercy ceased forever? Has 
His promise failed forevermore. What? Promise failed forever? What kind of what kind of statement and question is that? You know, you don't get the right answers asking the wrong kind of questions like this. <laughs> Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Say la, meaning just think about all that. You know, he's feeling some things that sometimes some very committed Christians even have felt at times that whatever God has said and promised and stuff, it's just not kicking in right now. I'm not, I'm not feeling it. I'm not getting it. It's not happening. But all of his questions are pointing to the Lord doing something different than what he has said he would do. And here's the resounding answer to all six of these questions. It is a huge N-O, no. No, God has not forgotten. He hadn't cast off. He hasn't quit. His mercy hadn't run out. He's not done with being gracious. None of these things are accurate questions. They're all nonsense. And yet so many times, even top shelf people, people like Asaph, can end up entertaining these kinds of questions and it's so destructive and brings you and, and verifies why you are overwhelmed. You're overwhelmed by these crazy questions. But he, he gives us some help starting in verse 10. Thank God for some help here because this is a deep hole that this guy is in. So he tells us how this started to change for him. And the reason I'm bringing all this up is because it's going to change for you too. And even if all these kinds of crazy questions have not been exactly what you've been asking, what he starts to point out here is the prescription, not for being overwhelmed, but being the overcomer instead. And these are simple ideas that I'm going to bring up to you. Things that around here you would have heard very likely taught many times before. But watch this. Beginning in verse 10, he said, This is my anguish, but... Everybody say, but... Now, the but is going to change everything that's already been said based on what he's about to say. So watch this. He said, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely, I will remember your wonders of old. He tells us the first thing that he's going to do now is have a selective memory. He's going to choose what to remember and what to let go of. It's absolutely vital that we understand that this tool of memory that God has given us is designed to serve us and not defeat us. And yet it requires a decision like this. I will remember certain things. What that also means is there are certain things I am choosing to not remember, a selective memory. There are things that have gone on in our life, things you've messed up, things you didn't decide right, you didn't act on in time, you didn't believe or take hold of, or various things that went south and went wrong, that while I understand the importance of learning from past mistakes, I get that. But what his point is, is I'm not going to let those replays of my past feed my present. It's not going to define me. I'm not going to be defined by those replays. You know how the replays go. You press replay and here it all comes again. It's what they said. I can't believe they said that to me. I can't believe they did that to me. I can't believe what they uh, think about me. And bam, 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 bam. Here comes all of the replay. In living color and Dolby sound, is Dolby still a good thing? It's, I've got to keep up, you know. We're not talking about Technicolor anymore. We've gone beyond that. Well, whatever the latest is, man, the brain just can spit out all of this nonsense and trash. And even though it is true history that happened, it can even be enhanced over time. You can add to how bad it was and... And it now sounds even worse than it used to be. 
ooh, I didn't understand all the nuances of how evil they really were towards me. But I get it now. And man, the, the replays start to feed and define a present that you really don't want. So he's told us here, I'm going to remember something different. I'm going to remember what God has done. Maybe not only what he's done in me, but even what he's done in others. Testimonies of how God healed. Testimonies of how God delivered, how he provided. The events of divine intervention of God doing things in people's lives. I'm going to remember what he did for my friend or for this this person I heard and watched the testimony. I'm going to stir that up and let that begin to divine my present. That replay begins to feed my present, but it also begins to feed my preplay of the future. Notice what he says in this next statement. He said, not only will I remember the wonders of old, but in verse 12 he said, I will also meditate on all your work. Everybody say meditate. Meditate. Meditation, of course, is is a spiritual exercise. It's something we do to fill our minds. It's not meditation like Eastern meditations teach of emptying your mind of everything and coming up with a mantra of some sort to bring calm. It is instead to fill your mind with the thoughts of God and bring a supernatural calm into the situation. This isn't just a mental exercise. It's a very spiritual thing. But here's the point I want you to catch. Meditation is different from remembering. In some translations, this word meditate is translated to imagine. I will imagine your wonders and your work. I'm not only remembering God's work in the past. I'm imagining Him working in my future. I'm getting the picture the pre-play, the movie in my mind is now taking on a different script from what the past replays that I have decided not to play. I'm not going to let that create not only a, a present I don't want, but a future. I mean, if you'd let the replays of your past that where things went wrong, if you let that roll around in you and continue to feed you, it'll not only feed your present in ways you don't want to experience, it's going to create an imagination of your pre-play. Your replay is going to create a pre-play that you don't want. Is this making sense to you? See, we all have these kinds of things going on in our head, and Asaph here gives us by the Spirit of God some real clarity as to how to take our memory, select God's word and God's ways and God's work in order to bring the right kind of memory alive in us so that it feeds the present and feeds these days the way God really wants them fed so that your faith is laying hold on God's promise for the days ahead instead of taking all of the information you've had or even that you're getting from present events taking place by news media feeding your head and allowing that to create an imagination. You know, you feed enough on wrong information, even current information. You let the media and the current reports of the economy or diseases or plagues or the outlook for the rest of the year or next year or the next five years or blah, 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 whatever it is, you let the wrong commentators create an imagination in you and you are going to stay overwhelmed. God's given us answers for this. So the movie in your mind takes on a new dimension when you hit replay and you replay the wonders of God, the stories of events that he has has demonstrated his authority and brought deliverance. And if he did it for one, he's ready to do it for you. If he healed anybody, which he has, he's healed many people, we have scripture for it, we have testimonies right here in this house of God doing amazing things. And if he did it for them, he's ready to do it in you. And he's ready right now to show himself strong on your behalf. He's looking, the Bible says, he's 
he's clear about this in Scripture, that his eyes are going back and forth over the whole earth looking for those whose heart is loyal to him. And here's what he wants to do. He wants to show himself strong on their behalf. You put yourself in a place of him showing himself strong on your behalf because you've made yourself loyal to him and his word and you've put it not only in your heart, but you've put it in your head. So he gives us not only the clarity about the replays and the preplays, but then he says this, going back to verse 12, he said, I will also meditate on your works, now watch this, and talk of your deeds. He said, I put it in my mouth. I talk of your deeds. Not only the deeds he has done, this would include the deeds that he is doing now. I'm putting it in my mouth that this is my day for healing. This is my time for victory. This is my time to be free from depression, from anger issues, from anxieties, from all kinds of attacks that Satan has used against me. This is my time. Say it out loud. This is my time too. We take it in Jesus' name. We really release the power of God with our own words, don't we? Our words are containers of either fear or faith. They hold whatever we choose to put in them. And as we declare what God has said, we are releasing the very power of God and releasing our agreement with Him that what He said is mine now. So we choose to believe it. Now watch this. Let me drop down to the end of this chapter into verse 19, and he says this. He wraps it up this way. He says, your way, God, was in the sea. He's talking about in the Red Sea. You remember the Exodus, right? Okay, that was like three of us. It's in the Bible. It was an amazing event. Some saw the movie, though, with Charlton Heston. You remember that? It's it just all... He said, your way was in the sea and your path in the great waters and your footsteps were not known. When Moses brought Israel right to the edge of that Red Sea, there was nowhere else to go. They couldn't go back. There was Pharaoh and his armies. They couldn't go to the sides because of the terrain. All there was was a sea in front of them and it appeared that there was no answer that would bring them deliverance. It just would not have occurred to anybody, and it didn't, that your way is going to be right through these waters. But watch what it says. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. And where did, where did that lead Israel? Right through the middle of the Red Sea on dry ground. Amazing deliverance that you wouldn't dream up. And what did God do? He told Moses to lift that staff, a stick, over the sea, and then God divided the waters. Amazing. Aaron said, that's the kind of works we remember. And based on that, we can understand that even when we're up against our Red Sea, you may be there right now. You're up against something that doesn't look like you can find a way through it. God's path was right through the sea. His footsteps were not seen, but there they were. And that's true for you and me right this minute. Let me wrap up with this passage from Psalm 139, verse 5. This is from the Passion Translation, and it reads, Your, or You've gone into my future. Listen to this. You've gone into my future to prepare the way. And in kindness, you follow behind me to spare me from the harm of my past. Isn't that powerful? This is God's work to deal with the days ahead because he's also dealt with the days behind us. Your past has no right to harm you, no matter how Satan tries to use it against you. He's gone into your past and delivered you from the power of it. 
but he's given us the tools to do it with, a selective memory, to choose to meditate on God's word and declare what God says, that this is my day of deliverance in Jesus' name. And he goes on to say this in the balance of this passage in verse 5. He said, with your hand of love upon my life, you impart blessing to me. And that's what I'm declaring to you right now. That God has gone into the days ahead for you and he has created a path that drips with abundance. That's what Psalm 65, 11 says. God crowns your year with his goodness and his paths drip with abundance. This is how we get on his path, the things I just described. And it does something in our brain even. It literally creates new neuroplasticity pathways in our own brain to connect with new connectors. You actually can create brand new connectors in your own head. I mean, researchers have seen this in scans and, and verified that it actually does happen. This is beyond my pay grade, but this is amazing information. That because of our mindset, our choices, and our words, they've even, they've even proven that there's parts of the brain that respond that way of creating brand new pathways by only two means. They create these by the data that you have already received coming up in your memory. So there's that selective memory. But by also responding to the sound of your own voice. It's been verified by researchers, but there it is in Scripture already, that we will talk of His deeds. And what will it also do? It will release power in us to create new pathways in our own brain that make it easier to embrace the next time, and then the next time there's more of it, and the next time it, these these connectors get stronger and more abundant in our own brain. So we are literally renewing not only our mind, but we're renewing our brain by making these choices to think the thoughts of God and declare the words of God and put it in our own mouth in Jesus' name. So God has said He's going to go into our future and He creates blessing and abundance and he's going to take past events in your life so that they don't harm you any longer. And he's given us some detail as to how that happens. Isn't that powerful? So I want to do this today. I want us to take hold of these things by faith and make it personal right this minute. I want you to stand with me if you would. This is more than information, really. It's intended to be an impartation of the Holy Spirit that brings light and insight and revelation. It's not just knowledge that we want from God's Word. We want insight and revelation as to how we apply this and benefit from these things taking place. And we do that by faith. We receive these things by faith. So I want you to say it out loud. In the name of Jesus, I receive by faith insight and revelation for these days that I'm in right now, that I stand fearless, filled with faith, surrounded by favor. I declare that my path has been laid out before me. God's path that drips with abundance. I declare, God, you've gone into my past that it not harm me today. And I receive it all by faith that your hand is on me and that you bless me. I receive it in the name of Jesus. Do you? Do you receive it? Come on, shout a praise to the Lord. Amen. Glory to God. But now here's what we also know in an audience this size and the number of people that are with us online. There's always people here and we're just so grateful that they are that really have never personally connected to Jesus. There's some of you that have never really settled the issue that you belong to God, that Jesus is actually the Lord of your life. You know, nobody makes that decision for us. Every 
Everyone who knows Jesus had to decide for themselves that Jesus would be Lord and that heaven would become their home and that they would give their life to Jesus and that Jesus would share his life and greatness with them, with each of us. And he's ready to do that for every single person that makes that choice today. You're standing here today or you're with us online. You've got a decision to make. This is absolutely vital. It's the biggest thing you've ever done in your life, and yet it can be the easiest thing you've ever done. You do just what Scripture tells us. You believe that Jesus is alive today, raised from the dead. History says he was executed, but Scripture is so clear. He wasn't just executed. He rose from the dead alive forevermore. Glory to God. Witnesses saw him ascend into heaven. I mean, there's so many amazing things that took place. He's alive right now. By faith, we just choose to believe that. But it's not only believing he's alive today, it is that we take him personally to be our Lord and Savior. That you give him your past, all the sin in your life. He's ready to take it and change things for you. He's paid the price so that that would happen for you. And he's ready to bring that truth to you and fill you up with himself. You give him your past. You give him your present. You give him your future. You put your trust in Jesus and dramatic and amazing things happen. Doesn't happen any other way. It's simple, but it's profound and it's mandatory. There's no way around it. You have to choose it. Some of you, you've come here today and you know, you can tell right now that you're in that place of decision. And you've come to make that decision right now. And I'm going to ask you to do just something right now and do it sincerely right out of your own heart. You say, Dennis, I want to make that choice and I'm making that choice right now for Jesus to be the Lord of my life. And I want to ask you to pray for me that I would receive just like you're talking about and have Jesus as Lord as I leave this place today. If that's you, I want you to throw a hand right up in the air where I can see it, if that's you. You've never made Jesus Lord of your life before, thank you. But today you're making that choice. Lift your hand up high if that's you. All over the audience, thank you, sir. Right up here, right back here, thank you. Somebody else. Come on, this is the real deal. This is how it happens. We make a choice. Yep, we've got someone up here, another one over this way, some others in the audience. Make sure I see this. I want to know that we're in this together, and I want you to know that we're in this together. If you're with us online still, you can lift a hand right where you are, even alone in front of your screen. The anointing and the presence of Jesus is right there for you, just like he's here. There's no difference. So here's what I want us to do together as an audience. If you raised your hand, I want you to raise your hand once again, and I want everybody here to also lift your hand. And we're going to say something together and stand with these people at the throne of grace in this moment. Say this together right out loud, right out of your heart. Oh, Father in heaven, I believe in Jesus and that Jesus is alive, that he's everything that the Bible says he is, that he's Lord of all. And I announce today that Jesus is my Lord. Jesus, I make you Lord of my life. I give you my past and present and future. I put my trust in you that I belong to you from now on and that thank God you belong to me also. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I'm a disciple of the Lord Jesus from this day on. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Glory to God. That's how this happens. That's exactly what takes place. A new creation is what Scripture calls you now. Brand new in Jesus. Old things passed away. Sin forgiven. You're brand new in Christ. He holds nothing against you. He remembers your sins no more. Man, there's so many things that just took place in a flash of time.
Thank you, Jesus. It's all real. And now you're going to get to spend the rest of your life and even eternity discovering how far this takes you because of this decision you've made just now. Glory to God. I want to ask you to do something else. In a few minutes, this, this uh, service is going to be dismissed. Not just yet, but in a few minutes. And if you put your hand up for the first time or you made that choice and decision and just now made Jesus Lord of your life, I want you to, instead of going straight out, I want you to take a, a bit of time and just come to the front and meet with some of the people from here at the church that will be available and just let them know this decision that you've made. Scripture's real clear about this. It's not only that we do this before God, but we do it where we tell people. And right now, you can just go ahead and do exactly that and let somebody here at this church know. They'll be available to pray for you if you have something that you need prayer about. We all do, and you're free to let them know that this would be a great time to pray and receive something great from God. Doesn't mean you're joining the church, so don't feel like that's the obligation by coming forward, but... You know, it'd be, it'd be great if you did. That's for sure, man. You'd be welcome. There's no question about that. But this is an important time for you to act on it. And if you're with us still online, you can push the prayer button uh, link that's, that's there on your screen, and, and somebody will be there to be able to pray for you just like people are praying here. So take advantage. One last thing that I want to do. I know I've kept you slightly over time, but guys like me just, just don't do well at quitting. But I brought some materials, as I always do, uh, from our ministry. This is a book that my wife Vicki wrote that is so powerful. Yeah, that's how I feel about it. It's entitled, Help, It's Dangerous Out Here. She's got lots of books out there. This is her most recent. And this is so powerful. It's subtitled, How to Walk in Supernatural Protection. If there's anything we've needed in these last number of years... We've needed it our whole life, but man, it feels like supernatural protection is right on time right now. And this is packed with event after event, testimony after testimony of Vicki's life, our experiences of God's divine intervention and some very dramatic moments. It's, it's a, an exciting book to read, but it's also full of how to tap into the things of God and scriptures and use your faith for that divine protection in your own life. So you'll want to take advantage of that. It is so strong. And uh, if we run out on the table, of course, you can go to our website, dennisburkministries.org, and you can order it there or even download it if that's how you like to do it. Uh, but take advantage of that. There's also a book on the table that I've written, and it's entitled Empowered by Grace, When the Impossible Becomes Possible. God's grace has been given to all, anyone that will receive. And God's grace is there not only to connect us to God, but to empower us to stand in places and ways that we've been unsuccessful at so far. He empowers us to do the impossible by the grace of God. You don't deserve it. You can't earn it. God gives it freely. And it's a free gift. And you can develop the empowering life of God's grace in your life. So take advantage of that. Lots of other things available. Love for you to take advantage and, and let it be a blessing to you. Are you glad you came today? All right, come on, shout another praise as Pastor Brian comes back. God bless you. Thank you, sir.